Hey folks, glad to have you here. Um, that was quite a busy week uh, because of this home office situation. I don't know what you're doing all day, but um, well, home office is quite uh, demanding. Um, I'm quite happy to be here tonight and do the stream. Um, it is about uh, quality assurance and trust and ways of collaboration uh, that are implemented in two different ways in GitLab. So this is what I want to do tonight. And uh, I have another person joining me, uh, which is Betty Buffer. Uh, so we have Paula Peterson, uh, Peter Paulson and Betty Buffer, who I will introduce later to you. Um, there's always the possibility to collaborate directly in this show on the repository that uh, I will show later on. So there are several ways to request access. Write me on Twitter, write me a mail. Um, you can write me in the comments, um, whatever you want. And um, I'd be happy to uh, have the situation here to have somebody of you folks watching collaborating live with me. So um, first thing I want to show is uh, I have set up a YouTube channel because um, these episodes disappear uh, frequently on Twitch, which, which is the concept. So um, it's not forever. Um, and I don't want to keep things forever, but longer f than four days or uh, um, 14 days or something. So I set up a Vimeo channel and I set up a YouTube channel, whatever you be like better. And uh, you can uh, follow me there. So this is the this is the new uh, channel on YouTube. I'd be happy if you uh, follow me so you never miss some new teaser or trailer. And I plan to do some interviews in the future with folks from the open source movement and the open science movement and open education movement here. So uh, don't miss anything. If you like to follow me, I'd be happy. Um, so let me do just a little uh, check if this is uh, working correctly here i don't know uh if the if the bit rate is correct let me see um so yeah so um i have some errors here hopefully that's not uh that's not uh problematic for you uh please write me in the chat if there's some problem all right um what i want to do tonight is uh explain the difference between branches, working on branches in a team and working with forks. <clears throat> so because um, the, for me, the success story of uh, platforms like GitHub, um, the success story is that folks can work together without even knowing each other and without the need of trusting each other in the forehand. So imagine that you work with your colleagues that you share the same floor at work it's not a question of trust there well perhaps it is but uh, usually you're a team you work together in a team and uh, <clears throat> as i showed before in, in previous episodes uh, you'd put people that you work directly with that you know as members in your team in your team um, and make them members of your project. And if that is possible, work is quite easy because um, the processes of working together are quite simple. Well, you have to judge if that is simple, but um, for me as somebody who spent some time in GitLab and GitHub, um, this is a procedure that after you know how it works, it is the same thing over and over again. So it shouldn't be a problem. But what about people that you want and that you need and that you uh, perhaps will never find with direct contact, that will never, uh, you can never reach out to, but you want them to join the project, to contribute to the project in a way. Um, and perhaps you don't want them to add, to be added to the project in the first place as a team member because you don't know each other. Perhaps you first want to see no, can they code? Can they write? What is the quality of their work? And uh, from another perspective, not from this 
perspective of mistrust or um, let's say a perspective of uh, um, waiting or being a little bit closed, but from a perspective of being open for gifts and contributions and things that surprise you, how is the mechanism for being surprised with contributions? And um, these, this openness, this technical implementation of openly working together um, is for me the success story of GitHub and now as the, uh, the open platform GitLab that I'm going to talk about tonight. So this is what really fascinates me because uh, if you have a look at GitHub, which is uh, am amazingly uh, collecting everything that is so somehow a cultural inheritance uh, of uh, the digital age, um, and they are also archiving that in the uh, in the um, polar region now because it's so important what people contributed to this platform that it is worth storing it underneath the earth. Um, let me let me show you this. This is an interesting story. So because this is GitHub Archive, this is the Arctic Code Vault program. Uh, well, this is the website. So let's have a look here. This is for me. This is quite amazing because uh, okay, I'm I'm working with the Paranoid browser. So you see this here. No, you don't see this. I click on uh, U metrics. You don't see the. Uh, uh, pull down on the pop-up. Well, there it goes. So it is. Uh, I I uh, actively have to switch on some um, libraries and stuff to show this. Well, they are preserving at GitHub. They are preserving the open source software for future generations because they think, well, perhaps something might happen to the Earth that um, means a complete well lockdown in a way, and we have to start over and over again with things and starting over and over again with software programming and um, hardware uh, is not a perspective that we like. So if everything's broken, we would be happy to have uh, the software that we need to get things running again. And for this hopefully uh, never occurring case, GitHub set up the GitHub Archive program. <clears throat> so I put this in the chat. So if you want to if you want to have a look at this one, uh, this is amazing. Um, okay, so the GitHub platform, the GitHub, not the GitLab, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, concrete or uh, hands-on part of this show, um, the GitHub um, platform is so successful because they... Um, they set up a way to contribute, which is called the fork. And uh, forking projects is a simple way of copying them. But this way of copying a, a project for your own needs has also a mechanism of giving back to the original project. And this is something I want to touch in this episode, distinguish the two. So, um, first of all, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to work on a uh, repository that you all know. It is uh, set up by Paula Peterson. That's still the report. Next episode, I think I'm going to switch to some uh, different to a different project because I have an idea to really work together in a way that uh, has to deal with the coronavirus situation, the economic situation. Well, I'm, I'm I have to think it over, but I think uh, I have a I have a good example to to work on, and. Second thing is, uh, semester starts next week, no, the week after next week, and I will have students, and I would like to uh, have them collaborate or show them, them some stuff. So let's see what happens. To, today, I want to work with this repository, and let's see what we have here. Let's see if we have some uh, request access. I didn't get any mail, so I don't think I have any. I go to, uh, to the member section. Well, no, there's no no request. There are four people. It's Paula Peterson and Peter Paulson. I don't know if uh, Roni M is joining or uh, T. Liefman, uh, if they are here. So if you are, please give me a sign in the chat um, and uh, I will uh, integrate you into this episode, um, which would be fun and which would be quite easy. So this is the report that we're going to work on. And 
First of all, um, I want to show you a minimal piece of project management when you're working on a project. So this is the thing that leads us to a good management of branches. So let me um, repeat shortly while we are, what we have here. Perhaps this is the first episode you're watching and you're not uh, into this project. This is a very simple project that generates um, a report on animals in the neighborhood. As you see, this is all nonsense text and uh, lorem ipsum, but um, it, this is not about the content, this is about the concepts and the uh, workflows in GitLab. So what we have here is uh, two important files, which is the readme.md, a markdown file, which has the content of uh, this report. It's the, the only file right now. There are other files that have been uploaded in the second episode where I've been uh, speaking about um, collaboration on Office documents. And we have this configuration file. Let's have a little look into this one because um, I zoom into this one so we can see this uh, clearer. Uh, first, we pull a Docker image from the Docker Hub. It's the Pandoc image and we spin up a container we pull the, um, the source code, which is the markdown file, into this container and run the program. Well, it's not the only prom program, but it's the primary program uh, or the primary command that this container can run. It's pandoc, take the input file readme.md and write the output file minus o readme.pdf. So that means whenever somebody changes something in the readme file, um, this pipeline pipeline is going to run and it's going to generate a readme file, which we can see, I zoom out again, which we can see in the artifacts download or which we can see in, the, uh, in several places. So, for example, we can download the artifacts here. We can also see them at the end of the pipelines. So, if you remember, we go to these pipelines pages. We see here we have a pipeline passed. Uh, six days ago, well, that was last week. And uh, this is the job that has been running for some time. And here we have finally have the job artifacts generated. So this is the PDF that came out of it. So, and um, this is what it looks like. Well, a simple document. So this uh, episode was just to show how Docker images can uh, be taken into, into this pipeline as the main building part. So this was, uh, that was the reason why the, the episode was called Build Anything with GitLab. So whatever you can do with the Docker container, you can generate or do with this GitLab pipeline concept. Now, what's the hack about um, working with branches? So first of all, the idea is that not everybody, even if there's a single person working on this project, that not everybody is working on the same in the same room or on the same branch, as we, as we would say. So, um, for your own uh, mental health and for your own uh, joy, you would not destroy what's working. So, we have a good text. Many people contributed, for example. You wouldn't experiment with the running ver version, um, especially when it's running code and uh, you make money with that code. You would like to have a place where you can experiment, where you can try out things, and when you're done and everything is fine, you want this experiment that worked out quite well being merged into the main or product productive branch. So in this concept, I demonstrated in the previous episode, we have here a pull down for branches. We don't have any branch here. It's the only branch is the master branch. And now I want to uh, show you um, a good way of organizing your work and the communication about your work with uh, issues and branches that result from these issues. So I would not suggest doing something like this, going to repository branches. You can do that, but I have a better way. You can click on new branch to copy what you have to a new branch and work on that branch. But um, nobody will see that you have this branch. Nobody will know why you have this branch. So a better way that I absolutely suggest to follow is, first of all, um, make an issue um, on this page, issue, issues. Let's say new issue and put down what the user story is. Well, user story is, um, um, is a concept 
from the Agile um, project management method. There's a great book I want to show you. Um, it's by Mark Cohn. This was the book that I read first about user stories. Um, let's see what it, where it is. Mm, Mark Cohn, user stories and examples by Mark Cohn, better user stories. Well, you see there's a lot on that. Um, let's see, Mark Cohn. Well, uh, we can go to a web page, user story mapping. Yeah, well, that's it. User stories applied. So this is the English book. There's also a German version, whatever you like. Um, this is a great book for learning what the idea of user stories is. And has, has also some great chapters at the end of the book um, about uh, extreme programming and um, the culture and the social aspects of programming. I love the book and it was some kind of my, well, my Bible for uh, diving into um, agile working together. So therefore we need a title um, for this issue. So let's say um, the, the title could be um, could be built like a user story. As a reader, I want to know um, where the neighborhood is. Well, I don't know if I spell neighborhood right. Um, well, I would look this up later on. Um, I want to know where the neighborhood is. So it's a report about animals in the neighborhood and a reader might want that somewhere in this report there's a chapter about where is that neighborhood is it in london is it in new york uh is it in the backyard or in the front yard or what is it so um this is some kind of requirement that a reader might have so somebody who's we've been talking about uh said something about this uh, report and said well what neighborhood do you mean so there needs to be a description for this, let's say, feature. It's another feature of a software or it's another feature of our report. The report gets better because we have, um, we have this, uh, um, let's say we have um, accepted this requirement. So um, um, I want to know where the neighborhood is. Well, it looks like I spelled it correctly. doesn't care well look it up <laughs> yourself i will do later so i want to know where the neighborhood is um and uh, would like to read some context information about um the season the uh time of uh the duration of the research. So you get you gather information in the user story from people who have a demand, who have a requirement. Uh, well, and you have it's your job to do something with that. This also counts for written text, like reports or articles, scientific articles, and it also um, is true for software, of course, where all this culture comes from. Comes from, um, as you will have noticed, I just transfer. Um, software culture to writing culture in this example because using GitLab this way is usually something that you would do for code but I do it for written text and uh, some um, different types of text. Well, um, I assign it to myself which might be in another way of project management somebody else and I can put it, uh, I can hang it on a milestone, I can hang on labels and uh, put a due date here. This is not exactly what I'm going to talk about. I think I will do an episode about my understanding of using GitLab for project management, but this is not what I do tonight. So this is this is the issue. So and this issue can be submitted here, and this means what we see now is the issue. So it uh, has to be done by Paula Peterson. She's the assignee, and uh, you see some other information here. Is one participant. Whenever somebody does something here, I get notified. And this is what I really like about issues because all the discussion with customers or with colleagues or with uh, partners in agencies or in uh, other universities can be done in this issue. So if you don't have enough information about what, uh, what you have to do, well, ask and discuss. So first of all, use this issue to discuss what has to be done and uh, think of a 
of a building where you are um, down in the lobby or you are in the reception or you are somewhere in a central place place at an information point. Uh, you're talking to somebody and you're asking and you're asking and finally you understand what you have to do and then you go away into the room where the work has to be done. So now if you know enough about this issue, what has to be done, it's like a to-do, you can leave for um, going into another room and this and speaking in, in the terminology of, of um, git you go into another branch and this is what we can create from this issue here we can uh, first pull down this little um, window here uh, if we just click here it makes this create merge request and branch we can just create a branch but I want to show you what the idea is of create merge request in the branch, which is the default um, uh, situation here. And the second thing that is quite nice, because you don't have to care about any convention of uh, naming your branch, is it takes the number of the issue, which you can see also here up in the, um, in the URL, what is it called, address uh, form, and it's, uh, it's followed by the sluggified uh, title, and this is the name of the branch, which is cool because you know uh, from the name of the branch uh, which issue it's related to, you can read all the documentation and conversation and negotiation about this branch in the issue uh, where the number refers to, and you know from a good sluggified title what the branch is about. I absolutely suggest to work this way because it makes things very easy. So, um, so here the source branch, so where this branch, this new branch that's going to be created will be copied from is the master branch. Well, clear because we just have this one branch, but we could use this in a different way. I never did this, but you can. So, uh, first of all, we have this, uh, we have uh, explained the setup. I uh, shut this again, so I could have clicked here or I can just, which I always do, I click here, and then I create a merge request and a branch. So we have to talk about a merge request because the merge request, well, I do this first and then talk about that. So I click, and now we get a new branch, and we are led to the page that has to do with all the concepts of uh, merge requests. So we have to go through this, otherwise it doesn't get clear why we do this uh, so complicated because before I showed you well click here and say new branch and you're done this is much easier but uh, it's worth talking about the idea of creating an issue first merge request afterwards and then start to work not before so uh, the thing here is uh, what is that information now you can access the merge request navigation tabs at the top yeah okay this well this, this is good so I got it this is the page for merge request. There's one merge request. It's our new merge request here. And it's um, it has three different informations in the title. So the first is, that is the name of the issue. This is what we plan to merge when we are done. And the signal for that we are not yet done is work in progress. So GitLab copies the title of the issue for the merge request and puts uh, some kind of a flag in front that means folks i'm working on this but this is still work in progress i want this to be merged later on when i'm done but not yet this is what this signal says so um, and this is cool because everybody who's working on this project can see that there was an issue that someone took and now is working on. So there's no need that somebody else takes the issue and works on it, unless there need to be different solutions to that issue. But everybody can see from the merge requests and from the issue page that there's somebody working on. And they can negotiate, they can join each other, whatever. So this is, a, this is the first line with three parts of information. The third part of the information here is resolve. That means, if this merge request is um, accepted and the branch is merged into the master branch, then the issue is resolved. Well, otherwise we wouldn't merge 
the branch into the master branch. If this wasn't resolved, then we would work on. So um, when we merge, when we accept, accept the merge request, the issue is uh, done, the work is done fine, and the work goes into the master branch. That's the idea of this first line. So, and the rest of this here, I will explain later because now I get the information, well, it's just a simple, a blank copy. There's no difference between your new branch and um, the master branch that you copied from because now I have just prepared the working situation and I have told everybody with my merge request as a work in progress that I have started to work on that. That's uh, important information because otherwise people do things twice or even thrice. So that is not a good idea. So um, the only information that I want to show you is that when I'm done, I request somebody, well, this will be me or some maintainer of the project, I want to merge this branch into the master branch. This is the plan that is put down in this merge request. Well, now let's do some work. Well, first let's have a look at the whole situation that is perhaps new now for at uh, several points. So I leave this page and I just want to check if the stream problem still exists, but um, well, it looks okay. If there are some interruptions, I will upload the recording later on. So hopefully nobody uh, is it nerfed by some transportation lags? Well, okay, now let's see what the information on this landing page is now. There's some new information. So first of all, it says there are two branches. Let's see what we get here. I have the default branch. That's the master branch. It always is the first branch. It's protected. It would never goes away unless you delete it for some other reasons. And we have the, the other branch, um, which, which is um, named as I, as I told you. So, and uh, they are the same. They are just copies because I haven't done anything. Now I go back to the landing page and look at some other information here. Um, what's also new is that in this pull down menu, you will find a list of the branches that exist. So first there was the master branch. Now there's the, the, the new branch, as you can see here. Well, and if you want to add something in a safe space now with all your, um, courage and your experimental ideas, you can do this in the branch because nothing bad will happen. Um, if you mess it all up, you just delete the branch and start over with a fresh copy as a new branch. So branches are so great because you don't risk to destroy anything. If you destroy your branched version, no matter, delete it, start over again with a fresh copy. So even if you're a newbie to all this stuff, make a branch, test it out, try everything you want and see what happens um, when you do your own coding. With, with this is great for students also because um, they get safe spaces where they can experiment with everything. Um, I heard the story about uh, Russian film students who always got a copy, a real copy, a real uh, of film, uh, which was quite expensive, but they got this for themselves uh, by, um, well, what's the, what's the name of uh, um, the movie in English? Well, I looked this up. Well, they got it for a very, um, by Eisenstein, a, a very a famous movie. They got a copy to just cut the movie themselves again. So they, they invested in the students a whole uh, film reel to m make them cut it, edit it, and uh, make new versions of the movie. And the same idea is, um, the same idea is for um, branches. If you want people to be courageous and experiment, the branch concept is the right thing because they take the original web shop, they take the original book content and they remix it, for example. They remix it, they edit it, they copy, they learn. Um, this is the idea of branches. So it is a great concept um, for being experimental. So, well, I have to look this up. Otherwise, I, I, get, uh, I go to the German Wikipedia and, um, well, uh, let's see, it is called this way. Well, that's in German. And now what's it called in? A battleship Potemkin. Well, 
That's what I heard. This is the story. I don't know if it's true, but it came up to my mind just to explain the idea of giving a very expensive original to, uh, to students to experiment with that. And this is possible, of course, in the digital. Now, how do we start experimenting here? Um, we have a user story that means um, let's add uh, some context information about the neighborhood. So how do we do that? So we would, of course, switch to our room, to our safe room where we can do whatever we want. You see the page reloads and shows exactly the same that we saw before because it's just a copy. And now we do something that perhaps might work here. Um, we say we want a new file. And um, I say, well, this new file name is um, context information. Well, let's make it information.md. Well, I put here um, the neighborhood. Well, I go to uh, I want to spell this correctly. Oh, OK. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, this is American English. Well, I wrote American English. That was correct. Cool. So, um, no. Neighborhood. The neighborhood. And now I go to some uh, blind text generator, some here. So I take this and I go back and I paste this. So I click on soft wrap to see this. Uh, and I do some blank lines here. And now I would say this is enough. So um, let's make it dark. So, okay. Well, this is the context information. So what did I do? I added a new file, and I put down a um, some uh, uh, some nonsense information into that. This is new. So let's commit this change. And now we have a difference between the master branch and this branch. We should be clear. We have a new file here. And uh, what now happens, I think we did this before, I click on the new pipeline tab, so you see a pipeline running for the new branch. Um, this is what we have here. We have this pipeline configuration also running for branches, which is incredibly cool. Because if you work with students or with people who want to add something but are not sure what comes out of it. Everybody gets a final version generated from their contributions and can see what it is like. It can be the, um, the object of discussion. Um, and you don't have to merge it first to see the result. So let's see what that means. I have this pipeline, this pipeline uh, is through. I go to this build job and uh, the job succeeded. And now I go to browse. Well, I knew that this was happen. I, I just want to show you what the case is. It's there's nothing about the context information because we have to update another file. It's the same that we that we already know. So um, it's the same. The reason is that we have to change the GitLab CI YAML configuration as well. So I go back to this page here, and now there's a little bit. Uh, so there's a trap. People might go into this GitLab CI YAML file right now, but they are because they went to the went to this homepage. They they um, they, they switched back to the master branch. This is really something that you have to keep an eye on. Um, usually, I have a branch that is um, the default branch, and it's not the master branch, so that this cannot happen. That people work on, an, on a protected branch. But, um, well, I think um, if you get used to it, you have to do your work in your branch. And this is what you have to decide first, switch to this branch. So now, in this branch, this is my branch for this feature, I go to this configuration. And now I have to edit this file. And, well, you don't know that I have to tell you because uh, the concept here is not um, self-explanatory. Um, you can uh, make a chain of file of markdown files that uh, have to be generated for the for the final file. So let's do this here uh, with context information .md. and we want the readme file as well, and uh, we want the final file to be called report. Well, this is our change. So and now I get a, I put another um, 
uh, add to the list of files for the report. That's my commit message. I commit the changes. And now I'm interested in what comes out of this pipeline thing again. So I open up again the pipeline and the pipeline is running and I want to watch this because I, it's, it goes so fast that it's fun watching it. There's nothing else usually that I do in between. I just do this. I relax a little bit. I watch this um, because, um, well, yeah, of course you can do something in between, but it's some kind of relaxation for me always watching this going going on. So um, let's see what happens. Well, this goes quite fast. It's fine. And you see here the command for our new version of the report with this new file. So there are the artifacts. Let's browse the artifacts. They are called report now. And let's see what it looks like. Aha! Uh -huh. It starts with a new file. It's called the neighborhood. And then the report is falling. Well, so the, the uh, headline niveau should be uh, adjusted, but uh, it worked. So now I have, I think I have um, resolved the user story and I would ask somebody, the customer, the maintainer of the project, um, the head of research, whoever, about the quality of my contribution. And this is something that we can see now in the merge request. So let's go back to the merge request. And, uh, excuse me, <coughs> let's go back to the merge request, which we can do here. And as you can see, well, this is still the same headline. Um, I click on this one, and now there should be a different page. Um, I have some information that I want to show you. So still we want to merge the branch into the master branch. There's also a pipeline. And the information is that the pipeline is, uh, has been uh, run correctly through the whole process. And then you see this can't be merged right now because this is work in progress. So this flag here is not just uh, a word in front of the title. It's also a technical flag, flag that hinders people or maintainers to merge this branch because as long as the um, the person working on this branch and um, working on this merge request hasn't taken away this work in progress, um, she or he is telling, well, it's work in progress here. So um, this is something that we have to um, resolve later on. But the interesting information here is what is the difference between the new branch and the original branch. And this is can be seen on the changes tab. So if you go here, you can see, uh, well, first a, a bit complicated view, but it's very easy to, to read. The red color says this was there before and now the green version came instead. So as you remember, this was the line from the copy and then we made this out of that. And I hope you can see this in the stream picture. This is even a little bit greener than the whole line so that you can exactly see what parts of a line have been added or removed. Um, this is true for the first file, the GitLab CI YAML file. And then the second file is completely green because it's new, it wasn't there before, so there's no red. And you can see, see here the numbers, one contribution and one deletion, uh, six and zero. This is what you can do here. So now comes the discussion about the quality assurance. I like this very much. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit complicated and not everybody thinks it's cool as I do. But uh, this is the reason why I explain it here, because perhaps you like it. Um, thinking of Office documents, you know that there is a, um, uh, a margin it's possible to, to uh, comment on a text in the margin, which is quite nice and which uh, with, uh, uh, with current versions of Microsoft Word or LibreOffice is quite handy. It's okay. But uh, it gets cluttered when you really want to discuss that. And discussing things is very important. It's not just, well, don't write dog, write cat. It's working on text and working on code 
needs arguments quite often. And then the Word documents get cluttered. Uh, you have to uh, collapse and expand and all that stuff. Well, um, it's the Office style. I don't like this. I use this uh, other method and I want to show you. So in this state of merge request, where you have the differences between um, uh, an original and uh, Delta version and the Delta, you can discuss for every line in the text. So, um, so if I want to, if I want to say that something about this paragraph, I can click le on the left hand side on this icon here, and I can discuss here. Uh, well, uh, later. Um, I read about this, but uh, I don't want to comment on this because I haven't tried it out yet. So um, this is great. Um, I love Latin. Well, this is this is cool for example working with students because you can give them feedback directly in their code. My experience is that it takes a long time to get students to this way of collaboration, um, which is not bad, but um, it shows that it is not something that you can switch on with an information hour um, at the beginning of the semester. It is something that you really have to practice and where you have to be there for the people to solve problems, to feedback and facilitate. It's not something that is clear because you just showed it. So um, the idea and the potential is great, but it, in my experience, it takes a long time to get people to really work on merge requests this way. But decide for yourself, this is the potential. Um, this is um, this is what we can talk about. This there's also some mechanisms that I want to want to deal with uh, in detail here about um, review culture. So um, there's, for example, the idea that um, unless everything in the discussion hasn't has been resolved, the merge is not possible. Because if you merge, and people are not satisfied with the result of the discussion perhaps you lose them as contributors. So you have to respect what they contribute and you have to respect what they put in the discussion. So it's always worth reacting to everybody in the discussion in a polite way and in a respectful way and a value, valuable way. So um, I would say this is, I finished this review, <coughs> um, I submit the review and now it's no longer pending and somebody else, well, I do this all with one person. Normally, this is with two persons. I could have taken in Peter, uh, but um, uh, the same is true for Peter here. I didn't want to make it so complicated because afterwards I want to have a, um, a look into the idea of uh, forks, which are nearly the same, but quite different. So discussing merge requests is the place and the process and the manner to assure quality. Because as long as not the maintainer and everybody is satisfied with the contribution, um, people have to overhaul it and work on it again. And finally, when you're okay with that, you merge the branch, the contribution into the master. So it, it's possible that you send people away from a merge request and say, very nice, but could you please um, have an eye on formatting the text or the code? Or it's fine, but please have a look at the code coding guidelines and the contribution guidelines. We write uh, the code this way, please have a look and then come back again. And this is, uh, this is okay because you can give feedback um, to your colleagues, to whoever you work with in this way. Now, um, let's go back to the overview and finally say, this is okay, please merge this. So, and now let's say uh, Paula is fine with that she's fine. She got a good feedback from somebody else who had a look in this merge request. She re resolves this uh, WIP status. And now the merge request can be merged. I wonder why this, this doesn't disappear here. Let me click on this here again. Oh, okay. Well, this was a mistake in the... Um, why? In the user interface. Because normally the WIP status is also removed at the start of the title. Okay, and now I'm able to merge, as you can see here. So if I click here, 
my branch will be combined with the master branch. And I absolutely suggest that you delete the source branch. Don't keep old branches. Probably the, you have a reason for that, but whenever, when I learned Git and GitLab and GitHub, I always ran into problems because I th thought, well, um, I will save this branch for later. But think it over. It's not necessary to do that because um, you don't have to um, you don't have to worry about that your work is being lost because it's merged into another branch. So it doesn't go away, it gets integrated. So it's not lost. Now, perhaps you think, well, I keep the branch for later because perhaps I have an idea tomorrow and I want to add something. You can, but then open up a new issue, make a new branch, make a new merge request and make an, uh, an actual copy, a current copy of the state of the uh, project in that moment. You don't want to have tomorrow a version that was copied yesterday because you miss all the contributions from other people. So you work with a fresh copy. So delete your source branch. And uh, if you want to add something or correct, uh, um, um, uh, improve something, you uh, make a new branch and you make a new merge request and you start over again. This is what you do and you never get merge conflicts. I don't, I'm not going to show merge conflicts here because first of all, I'm going to show uh, how this ideally works. So let's merge. And now the branch gets deleted. And uh, let's see, there's no longer a merge request here. Good. We see here in the history of the merge requests, this was merged. When was it merged? That's right. Um, and then uh, we have a look at uh, the branches page. We've been there before. You see the branch is gone. And of course, we're interested in the file tree because we want to see is the contribution that we did here. Ah, it is. So now everything is here. And um, there should be at the end of the pipeline, there should be a new version. The pipeline is still running. Well, now it's done. We're going to have a look at the artifacts in the browse tab and have a look at report. So now the latest contribution is part of the master branch. And that's it. That's my way of working together with people in always the same way. Um, write an issue, make a branch with a merge request, start working on the branch and discuss in the merge request. When discussion is done, merge, delete the source branch, write a new issue, start over again. That's what you, what you should do for uh, this cycle, cyclus of um, working in your separate rooms, experimenting with things, being courageous, uh, nothing can happen. So this is, this is the first turnaround here. All right, um, so that's it. Um, good, so just have a look again at the stream. Um, if you still want to see something, I want to explain the difference with the fork. So first of all, first of all, I want to show you on the fly, I want to show you a new, uh, another program that I really love. I guess you know, because it's not, it's not so new anymore. Um, but I want to draw something in draw IO. I don't know if you know that program, but uh, let's use it here. It's called draw IO. Um, because, uh, and it's great because you can use it in the browser as well as on your desktop. And what you draw can be stored in GitHub and even GitLab as uh, being put into version control. Uh, let's uh, show how that works. Um, I'm going to create this on a device. I create a new diagram. You have you can have a look at um, yourself. Um, you go to draw I draw dot io and you can experiment with yourself. Um, and it builds um, an XML file. So. XML is uh, like HTML, um, a text-based format that, of course, can be put into the version control of GitLab or GitHub or whatever you need. 
So um, this is great, and it's greater than using uh, PowerPoint for that, because if you think of uh, schematic drawings or something like that, uh, because it generates vector formats. So you can use it in the web context as well as in the PDF context with LaTeX. And, uh, well, I love it. I show you why. I go to a blank diagram, and this is what you have. So have a look at the user interface yourself. I just wanted to point you to this great tool because I love it, and uh, I wanted to make something clear. So um, if I take this circle here, and I say this is, this is the project, um, I put the text here. I want to uh, show you the difference between um, working in a fork and working, working with forks and working in a team. And for example, you take, um, you take, uh, let's see, um, Paula. Well, I drag and drop Paula's avatar here. And uh, Paula is part of the project. So I put her here. And probably also Peter is part of the project. So I put Peter also on this drawing. And what I have here you see is the avatars that are generated for the for the members uh, of the team. So for example, he uh, he is part of the team. So this is the team. Um, uh, let's say this is the project and this is the team. So if this is the project, let's move this over here. If this is the project, this is what we're working on right now. It's the report in GitLab. So um, for this situation here, you use the way that I showed you before, the merge request. So what we do here is um, issue branch merge request quality assurance and uh, merge. This is what you can do inside with your team. This is what everybody in this team can do. But what about a person that comes from the outside? For example, if you take Betty. Welcome Betty, that is Betty. Betty Buffer. She wants to contribute. So she, she has two possibilities. I duplicated her. The first possibility is she can, for example, um, request access. Or she can ask, for example, um, for access to for being part of the team. But why should we let her, if we don't know her, why should we let her be part of the team? Well, she cannot destroy really anything. And why should she destroy anything? Um, but it's possible that people think, well, let's see first what you can do. Are you able to really have a quality, do a quality contribution? And uh, in the old days, when there was no Git and no GitLab, um, people, for example, working with the Debian distribution, they had to write patches over and over again, and they had to prove that they were worth being part of the team. So you had to contribute quality patches for and, and make features um, to prove that you're really a reliable and uh, valuable member of the team. And the thing is that this was all about mail and it was all about uh, knowing each other in a way where at least you had to exchange mails. And now there comes a, a very new concept with the fork, which makes it uh, unnecessary to give trust in the first place. Because what now happens is this person here, which is Betty Buffer, she is gonna um, fork the project. And, well, we have to... Well, I delete this again because I should do this the other way around because this is a copy of the project into her account. And what comes afterwards is very similar to what I showed before, 
but it has to do with some different um, concepts and it gets more complicated, but just, just a little bit. So let me show you. I set up another browser here. So first of all, let me clean this up here a little bit so that I myself don't get confused. So this is the screen of Paula Peterson. This is her project. She's the maintainer. And as we saw before, a Betty Buffer is not a member of this team. She's not. So I just show you like a magician showing you that there's nothing in the hat because I don't want to impress you in any way or just don't want to cheat. Um, I have uh, found another browser which uh, is very helpful because I cannot have two different windows of Firefox in uh, Open Broadcast Studio. So I uh, downloaded Midori which is this one. So it's another browser. It's, it's not my favorite browser. It's just a bra browser, but it's possible to just uh, switch users and not lock in and lock out again in this presentation. So this is Peter, um, Peter Paulson, but he is part of the team. And I don't want to show this fork thing with somebody who's already in the team. We don't need that. We need somebody who's not in the team. So I log out here. I sign out. And I sign in again with Betty Buffer. And here she is. All right. So she doesn't have any kind of project. So what she needs is she has to go to the project that is a public project. So uh, let's go back here. As it is a public project, Betty Buffer can take the URL here and copy this one and uh, do something that is quite new. So she goes here, goes to this website. Well, let's take this away. And now she can do something um, that can, uh, that means uh, forking the project. And uh, um, she has to do this uh well i'm like crazy just right now where's the fork button what's the problem here okay she can request access well that must be some um that must be some configuration thing that I know differently. Well, let me check something here. Well, I didn't check this before because I was sure that this is working. Um, let's see something. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so I have to log in into another instance of GitLab because I want to check this. Uh, if I'm wrong or what the problem is here. So I take two-factor authentication here and I go to, you don't see that, but um, I go to explore projects. I'm sorry, but um, I have to see what's up here. Okay, yeah, there it is possible to fork. There is a button. Um, okay, why is it missing here? So let's explore that. Um, I found out that in the instance that I knew there is a fork button, which is uh, quite easy to use. And I was sure that it is here. So I have to dig into the configuration page. So let's go back here and have a look at the settings in the configuration page. So let's see what is possible here. Is there something that I have to switch on? I guess I know where it is. Okay, so let's see this here. Aha, uh -huh. okay. 
Well, that's it. Well, I think that has to do with the uh, version that GitLab.com is running. And the version at my university that I use every day doesn't have the fork switch. Okay. Well, I'm quite happy I found it. Um, I switch it on and save the changes. And I learned something. Great. Okay. So um, now there is the fork button. Poo. Okay. I go back to Betty Buffer's browser. <coughs> Excuse me. And reload the page. And now I can do what I wanted to do. I can fork this repository as I want it. So I click on fork. And now I'm asked, um, where do I want to copy the original repository to? I, I'm going to copy it into Betty Buffers, so my account. Possible and not visible here is that I can copy it or fork it into a group or a company or whatever. Um, the idea is always the same. Fork means you copy an original repository or project into another account. So. I go to the website of a repository of a project, click on the fork button and copy it to my repository. And this is what happens here. So you see the information here. The project was successfully forked. It was forked from Paula Peterson's report. And on the other window, you can see um, if I reload the page, that there's one fork. So if you measure your success or the, um, the size of your community, of course, forks count a little bit. They are not a quality mark, but uh, when you get forked, somebody is interested in your um, project, in your work. And um, the other thing that we are going to deal with in a later episode is cloning a repository which is not being counted, but the fork is being counted. And it is a good idea, I will explain later, to first fork and then clone. Usually you don't clone the original repository if you want to work on that. So, But this is some mindset that you have. Of course, you can clone the original repository, but the idea behind the fork is different. No, let's see. Why did Betty Buffer fork? the repository of Paula Peterson. She did so because she is interested in contributing to it. She's interested in um, the freedoms she has here. She has access to it. She can learn from it. She can distribute it in a different way. And she can also contribute to it if the license is the thing. We haven't spoken about licenses. There is no license right now, but usually these are the freedoms of working together on open source and free software projects. So this is why she forked it. And I show you the fork because the idea of the fork is that you give back something at the end of what you did. So fork, it's absolutely okay if you just fork to get it and use it. But if you want to contribute and you want to give something back, and you want to show that you are a trustworthy person and that you want to find a way into the community that first initiated the project, then giving back from a fork is the thing. So and this is what I want to show because you will get this clear. It's the same as I did before, but have a look. Let's have a look at the, um, at the diagram again that I, uh, that I uh, set up here. So the fork means um, that we have this now, excuse me, this is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, copy this, but these are not the members here. She is here. So to the front. This is what we have here. She is, um, it's her project. So it's a copy. Um, she is the owner of this project. Betty Buffer is the owner of this project now after the fork. She can do whatever she wants. She can do within the project as if it was her project. And she wouldn't have been able to do this in the original project because she wasn't even part of it. But she copied it. 
Now it's her, her home. She can do whatever she wants. And if she's finished, if she's when she's done, she can make a merge request from her project to the other project. And this is something that we first saw within the project, a merge request from a branch. But now we're going to do a merge request from a separate project to the original project. So this is what we're going to see here. Um, let's go back to this um, Midori browser. Now, she wants to add something because uh, she thinks, uh, well, I want to I want to do something here. So she also writes an issue. Um, there are different f uh, philosophies about dealing with issues um, that are uh, dealing with issues from the original project and from my project. But as this is her her project now, she thinks she offers something that she might um, like to see in this uh, project. So as a reader, I would like to see some pictures of the animals. So it's clear uh, I want to see cats because it's the internet. Okay, um, that's what she wants to do. So she submits the issue. She is uh, working on the master branch. That's the uh, same thing as with Paula Peterson. And um, she wants to work on this, uh, on this branch again. So let us have a look here, first of all, at, um, at the configuration. I, I think I haven't uh, set up some things here in this uh, settings thing. So let's see again what we have here visibilities and permissions, public. So we want forks, we want pipelines, we don't need this one, we don't need packages, we don't need the wiki, we don't need this one, we don't need this one, we save the changes, and um, that's it. So we go to the issues, and uh, well, I wonder why I can't have uh, set up a A merge request here. Okay, so I have an idea. I think I have to explain the philosophy uh, first because um, otherwise uh, this this won't work. Um, yeah, because it's a fork. That's a fork. Okay, so let me see if that is if that works here. So let's go back to let's go back to this Paula Peterson thing here and uh, have another issue here. Wow, so um, as a reader I want to see pictures in the report. Well, let me see cats. Okay, assign this to me and, excuse me, submit the issue. And uh, now we can have this merge request here. So let me have, let me check something here. Um, Okay, so if I go back to the, so I switch back right now. I just want to have a look here before I tell you what's what's up here. Can okay, I see some pictures in the report? Well, also another configuration here. Mm. Well, I know this. I know this in a different configuration. 
Well, looks like um, there is a difference between this GitLab configuration, as I saw before, and my version. And I have to find out uh, for uh, for next time. I think this is better than having you watching and um, see me uh, clicking through the menus. Well, that's fine for me because um, I wanted to set up another project that uh, shows the the fork idea, the fork idea in a different way. Because I had the idea of uh, setting up a website where people could support their local um, economy in their in their um, in their city, because uh, due to the virus, many shops are shutting down, and I had the idea um, to have a website from the local stores with information about how they do their uh, selling stuff and uh, whatever they do online. And uh, for me, it's quite hard to find out uh, what kind of shops do what in the internet. You have to go to their shop and you have to see, well, um, they do this uh, somewhere, they don't do it, they just close and wait. And I thought it might be a good example of people that want to add to a... Um, to a uh, repository in a way that needs, of course, quality control, that needs uh, looking at uh, the information, is it uh, a serious information, um, and to put quality assurance onto this, uh, onto this concept. Well, then, as I watch, uh, watch the clock now, as I'm with a look on the clock, we're over an hour doing this. For me, it's fine. Um, I apologize for um, the, the end of the folk story, but uh, I, I learned that explaining the branch, merge, and quality thing took some time. So for me, it's fine if you come back in the next episode and I show you um, with a new example the idea of the fork. And I will find out if there's really a difference in this configuration as I know it or if I have some, something in my head that, uh, that hinders me from finding the right uh, process right uh, right now here because I get a little confused with uh, the github workflow and the differences with uh, with my instance which is the community edition I will tell you next episode in the next episode what the problem was if it was my problem or if it was a conf fun configuration thing I will tell you um, so thanks for watching um, and um, if you want to comment on this please write me something on twitter or in the comments of the um, youtube channel or the vimeo channel and if you have any suggestions what we should talk about shaping openness any kind of tool or anything that we should work on together and explore some new stuff i found new tools that i really want to explore um, please tell me and uh, I'd be happy if you join me next time or have fun watching this episode and the uh, recording. So um, have a great Easter weekend and hope to see you next time.